everybody, and welcome to this Launch Vic webinar, Growing Victoria's Ag Tech Sector. It's a very exciting day for us at Launch Vic. We've recently announced a new grant round in Ag Tech, and this is a sector that we're starting to put a real focus on. So it's great to be here today to talk to you about it with our esteemed panel, who I'll come to in one moment. But before we begin, as we always do at Launch Vic, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to acknowledge the tens of thousands of years of entrepreneurship and innovation our First Nations people have demonstrated and the leadership they continue to show in our startup ecosystem. We have a huge number of people registered here today. We were just talking, I think it might be our largest webinar ever. And it's definitely um, goes to the testament of interest that there is in the ag tech sector. To give you some context, Victoria is Australia's largest, largest agricultural producer, accounting for 28% of Australian food and fibre exports. But despite this, we've known for a while that Victoria's ag tech sector remains relatively small and underdeveloped. Our data collected through a host of sources and publicized through our Finding Startups database at findingstartups.launchvic.org estimates there are less than 40 ag tech startups in Victoria and 80% of those are based in Melbourne. To compare, there are more than 2,100 active startups in the state and over 400 of these are focused in healthcare and health tech alone. Despite ag tech being, agriculture being such an important industry to Victoria, it's clear that we need to build critical mass in our ag tech sector, and it's a sector that is rich with opportunity. And to address this, the Victorian Minister for Agriculture, Mary Ann Thomas, yesterday made a very exciting announcement. As part of this, Agriculture Victoria and Launch Vic will be teaming up in a two, new $2.2 million partnership with the specific aim of boosting the number of Victorian ag tech startups to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem and critical capability in this important area. The new partnership is going to deliver two things. Firstly, a community event series to connect industry, farmers and inspiring founders from across the state together at the AgVic Smart Farms that are also distributed across the state. Secondly, we're going to be running a grant round, our first grant round under our new strategy, which is going to focus on giving budding entrepreneurs and early stage that are focusing on ag tech the support, mentorship and networks they need to turn an idea into a viable startup. And I'm pleased to announce this grant round is now open. If you'd like to learn more, we encourage you to go to the LaunchVic website and um, we'll be holding an information session on at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 22nd of September, and I encourage you to join there. But to get everybody's entrepreneurial ideas flowing, I'm delighted to turn the attention to the main event for the day and welcome everyone to this seminar, as I said before, Growing Victoria's Ag Tech Sector. And I'd like to give a very special warm welcome to our three Ag Tech leaders who are joining us today. Phoebe Gardner, co-founder and CEO of Bardi, formerly known as Beyond Ag, one of Victoria's brightest startup founders who's on a stellar trajectory. Also Matt Pryor, co-founder of Tenacious Ventures and partner at Agthentic. Matt has played a long role in driving ag, uh, ag tech across Victoria and uh, is, is a key member of Victoria's ecosystem. And finally, Chris Staff, Head of Digital at Farming at Bayer ANZ. And Chris also brings a huge amount of knowledge about the industry. I'm going to give the panel an opportunity to introduce themselves properly in one moment. But before I start, just a few items of housekeeping. We have a Q&A channel. Please do send through your questions on this channel and I'm going to do my very best to moderate these. The chat channel is the best way to communicate with other uh, attendees. Please use this information to share anything that you have. We want this to be as interactive as it possibly can be. Um, but just to reiterate, please send your questions to the Q&A channel because that's what I'm going to be moderating. So let's get started. To, be to begin with, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to introduce yourselves and in one minute, tell us how you began working in ag tech and why you're so committed and passionate about this sector. So Matt, let's kick off with you. Right, I go first. Hey everyone, uh, thanks. Oh, so awesome to see so many people with an interest in, in ag tech. I, I grew up in Ballarat actually, uh, in and around farming. We weren't farmers, but I think I always had kind of dirt on my fingernails. Um, got a micro B computer uh, in my late teens and kind of tacked in the tech direction, spent some time in Silicon Valley, but ultimately ended up back in Australia and, and was thrown a project that was, you know, look at technology and work out how to manage water better in, in agriculture. And, and that was the, 
tack back in the other direction and, and really since the kind of early aughts have one way or another thought about the intersection of, of technology and agriculture, uh, first with Observant and then with Jane, the multinational who acquired Observant and more recently as a co-founder of the Accenture Group. And we're really established to back innovators who will have an impact in scaling up a nutritious, affordable and sustainable global food system. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. And Chris, can I please hand to you to tell us a little bit about your background and your current role at Bayer? Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, I'm probably one of the rare people who, who works for Bayer Crop Science in Australia that doesn't actually come from a farm or have a, a directly agricultural experience. So my uh, previous working experience was uh, in automotive and, and healthcare uh, before moving over here. Um, but um, I, I guess as a lot of people do, you, know, you get bitten by the bug with agriculture. And once I started here, um, quickly developed a passion for it. And uh, I guess my journey through a range of commercial roles here and um, in, in, our, in our region in Asia Pacific led me to uh, begin our, I guess, a more defined project scope around digital farming within Bayer in 2019. And we've looked to expand our presence and our offer in that space um, over the course of these last two years. And um, yeah, we're really excited um, and uh, highly invested both um, emotionally and strategically in, in digital agriculture and the ag tech space, both in this country and globally. So we're, we're really um, looking forward to an exciting journey in it. Fantastic, thank you. And Phoebe, can you tell us a little bit about your journey in particular, how did you become a founder? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. It's really great to be here today. And yeah, so I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bardi. And what we're on a mission to do is reshape the global food system. To do that, we're transforming food waste into protein and fertilizer with insects. My background and how I came to be a founder at Bardi was actually in looking at sustainable cities projects. Um, particularly actually in transport and rail initially. So I was working on these big billion dollar rail and train station projects over in Europe and also one in Sydney. And through that, those projects, which require sort of building train stations um, sort of in Amsterdam, say it's underwater or in Sydney, there's so much complexity to the city while it's all still running. I learned so much about the material flow of a city and started to ask the, and waste became a huge logistical issue in those projects. Um, and I became much more familiar with how waste was being managed in cities and started to ask the question with over a third of food being um, food that's produced being wasted, what would happen if we tried to transform all of the food waste coming into a city back into products that could service the agricultural sector? Um, I joined with my co-founder who was really big in soil chemistry and also an entomologist studying insects. And we came together to come up with the solution that we're pursuing at Bardi now. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Phoebe. So I'd like to kick off our conversation today by addressing the very nature of ag tech, which is the combination of agriculture and technology, which are two things that can be seen as being very separate. And they're separate in um, many, many ways. But one of the most apparent ways is often the urban regional divide. Agriculture, you think of being a very regional activity. Technology, you think about being in, in a city um, in a city of, of, of Melbourne or, or other cities. So Matt, how important are the relative levels of agricultural awareness and technology innovation for ag tech startups? Do you need to be an agricultural expert to be able to innovate or can you be a technologist coming in looking for new opportunities in ag tech? And where should programs be based to support the, the entrepreneurs on their journeys? Yeah, that's great. Uh, lots of sub questions there. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with perhaps an observation, which is even though agriculture is traditional in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, it has always had to be innovative. And so whilst not technology in the way we talk about digitally driven technologies per se today, agriculture has always involved a lot of technologically driven innovation. Um, uh, you know, a lot of them are mechanical, then electromechanical, and now increasingly electronic, digital, uh, et cetera. But yeah, you're right to kind of highlight the fact that the, at the modern technological trends very much are digital in nature um, or, or, or largely, and those aren't um, skills that people just, you know, otherwise have. So we do see that kind of need where people coming through different sort of pathways also need to come into agri agriculture. I mean, you mentioned the fact that sometimes, you know, startups haven't spent enough time on farm. 
So we definitely need to find that merger. We've got to have people who want to bring new thinking into agriculture have spent enough time on farm and with farmers to know, you know, what's practical, what can reasonably be asked of agricultural production, but by the same token, not necessarily be constrained or siloed by the way things are, are currently being done. So I, I love what you're doing here, which is uh, this idea that, that why don't we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of startups in, in the ag tech world? Like everybody who's got a passion to do something about sustainability, everybody who's got a passion to take their skills and, and really kind of make a dent, create, you know, affordable, nutritious food for Australians and for the whole planet, couldn't find a better place in agriculture to, to apply your skills. So hopefully we bring lots and lots and lots of people in, but just come in with an open mind, come in with a perspective that, you know, also overwhelmingly farmers are innovative, free thinking people who care an awful lot about the land that they work and, you know, kind of start from there and then, you know, see what we can do about, you know, change and innovation. Fantastic. And Phoebe, I have no doubt you've got something to add here. You've navigated this journey. How have you done that? Yeah, so we started Bardi in 2019, in mid 2019, in me, my partner and co-founder Alex um, in our living room. And from there, we were at the time um, had studied at university, at the University of Melbourne. And so we were had had some friends in the ag tech space that had gone through, who'd done some work in poultry innovation technologies, and they'd gone through the Melbourne Accelerator Program. So we went into that program, which was a 20K um, equity-free accelerator office space, and very quickly became immersed with that um, accelerator community. And it was just so pivotal for us to get a, um, an entry into the startup community, both of us being first time founders at Bardi. Um, since then, we actually went through another accelerator program. Um, and during that period, we were building our technology. So we had a free space at the University of Melbourne, a patch of gravel, where we built our very first test facility. I think some of the things I remember doing there are waiting for it to rain so that we could go and roll on the gravel on the ground to flatten it so that we could put the foundations down for that very first 60 square meter lab about the size of a shipping container. And then um, having uh, food waste delivered in the university car park on a Friday afternoon and having to have it out, sort of four tons of it that we'd hand processed by Monday morning when everyone was coming back to the university, um, packaged and back into that lab for the insects to process into a sustainable protein. So that was our start and we wouldn't have been able to move through those initial hurdles that you face as early founders and startups without the support of the community and the way we accessed the community was through those two um, accelerators that we went through so that was first the university one map and then subsequently startmate up in sydney fantastic and phoebe i i'm i'm smiling because i've heard your story before and you do a great job of taking people back on that journey to those early days. There was a particular time with fish heads, I remember you telling uh, me about. I think you have to tell that story. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I think at the time we had, um, we had three people in our team, we would had brought on this incredible COO who'd been managing um, sort of multiple facilities across South, South America where they were breeding mosquitoes, actually millions and millions of them um, as part of the World Mosquito Program to combat dengue fever and Zika virus. And it was backed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, incredible. And this, um, we'd had this incredible CEO come over, take a huge, huge pay cut um, and was just cooking insects for product trials every day in this tiny lab. And we had another batch of food waste coming through and we work with waste logistics companies. So all the usual big companies that collect waste and they tip it their waste at our facility. And they rang up an hour before we had a scheduled tip and said, oh, no, no, not this tip, but we've just onboarded a new customer um, from the fish markets. And maybe in the future, you might have some fish in your tips. Is that gonna be okay for your insects? So I went um, and we had a chat and we're like, yeah, that, that would be great. We're really interested in the nutritional profile and how that's gonna impact the protein content in the larvae. So I'm like, yeah, that's great. We look forward to the following tip. The tip arrived an hour later and it was just 100% tuna heads. And it's, you know, so 
we weren't expecting it. And these tuna heads, like I, tuna are the, the lions of the sea. They're genuinely enormous. And how we processed food waste at that point was we had a wood chipper from Bunnings that we'd bought with that um, part of that 20K equity free funding from MAP. And we stood there and realized that these two, four tons of tuna heads were not going to fit through the hopper for that tiny wood chipper and stood around and we had to clear that big pile over the weekend and we went to Bunnings and we bought three axes and spent the next couple of days um, overnight making sure we could process all of that and what was great is that we still use fish protein as part of our larval diet to get a great nutritional profile today but but that was the start a fantastic story and it shows the testament of what founders do to get their companies off the ground it's a great story Phoebe. thank you so i'm going to change tack now and um ag tech is is discussed as something that's largely about improving on farm outcomes and i know each of you have learnings and experience that you can share with us um, but I'm actually going to throw to one of our um, questions, David Coote, um, who's just put a question saying he's developing an energy management systems for farms and food processes. And farmers get fed up with the constant stream of people trying to tell them how to do their job, sell their stuff. How do we address this problem? Because we do hear this a lot. Um, Chris, I'm going to throw to you to answer this question. Thanks, Kate. And, and thanks for the question. Um, I, I would answer it in, in this way which describes how in, in our particular context, we consider, I guess, the potential value and um, effectiveness of a solution that we might consider bringing, bringing to a grower. So um, the, the very first question that we ask ourselves is, is the solution that we're looking to deliver answering a question, a challenge or representing an opportunity for a grower? And I think we've in a way touched on that um, already in our discussion today um, in terms of the concept of um, potential founders or technologies coming from outside of agriculture, looking into agriculture as an opportunity. And um, I think it's really important at the earliest possible time that the, the grower is at the absolute centre of the consideration of the solution that we're looking to provide. So we're really focusing on what are we addressing at that grower level and is it, is it solving a problem for them effectively? So once we answer that question, we then look to how a grower is able to access the technology. Um, is it easy for them to access? Are we creating friction for them in their potential to access a particular technology or tool? Um, and we, we really want to make sure that their access to what we're looking to provide is simple, straightforward, and, and really easy for them. The, the third aspect we then look at is the is their ability to adopt it. So when we look at the at the technology or the solution, how easy is it for them to bring that into their into their growing practice and their farming operations? Is it a straightforward? smooth integration in what they're doing or are we looking for a, let's say a rather more dramatic change to how they're operating and, and that's a really really a, a careful topic we need to consider and then of course we need to be able to provide them with the tools to measure the outcome of what it is that we're looking to develop and deliver for them so that's the sort of process that we look at in considering that there's a there's a lot of other challenges around the topic for example i'm, I'm sure anyone who's spoken to a grower um, in this space who's interested in new technologies, they're getting more and more concerned or sensitive towards um, just how many places we're asking them to go to to access technology. So um, I'm sure anyone who's talked to a grower would see them scrolling through their phone and it's just page after page of apps and landing places or interface points for them to, to access to different types of technologies. And these are, I think, concepts that all of us in the ag tech space, you know, with good intentions and great products looking to to, to deliver to growers, we need to consider how easy or difficult are we making it for them to, to take on um, the solutions um, that, that we're looking to provide them. So I hope that provides um, some insight, at least from our side. Absolutely. And I'd, I'd like to also give a shout out to Agriculture Victoria and their smart farms because they are demonstrator farms across the state. And part of our work that we're doing with Agriculture Victoria will be to activate those farms and, and increase the demonstration that's taking place at those sites. There's already great stuff happening and they're great places to reach out to understand where innovation is happening. There's a question from Kemi about what, um, how, how can we know what solutions to develop if we don't have access to farms and farmers to ask them what they need? Phoebe, I'm going to throw this one back to you because I'm sure this is something you must have accounted along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I think for us, it was one of the very first things we went and did as, as, 
early stage founders is go and start reaching out to potential customers. And then we've been working with those same customers ever since and we're, we're two years in now. So the for us, what that looked like from the two products that we produce, firstly, the insect protein, that was actually speaking to pet food manufacturers initially. So what we were doing is we were taking that tiny 60 square meter lab and pr- creating handfuls of sample products, sending them to independent labs for nutritional testing, and then taking that piece of paper and a handful of product and physically going and visiting um, potential pet food manufacturers that we would work with. And in that sense, how we approached working with growers was incredibly similar. The other product we produce is a organic import fertilizer. So what we were doing was going through our network, getting warm intros to growers, taking samples and running um, application rate tests again and again and again in different seasons on different crops, in their organic crops, in their inorganic ones, testing it against um, seeds that have specific fertilizers that went with them. It was, it's been a process that we've worked with growers for in multiple different areas um, over the two years. And we've just approached it that Ultimately, we need to learn about our product together and we're so lucky when growers are willing to open up and and work with us and we see it as an absolute gift. And so we try and on our end do all the work to make it as easy as possible for them um, to collect that feedback to really show that we're actioning it um, and then move forward um, ultimately. And and that's how we've been able to work in a number of um, different areas of agriculture. So we've worked with uh, hydroponics growers um, and we've worked with nurseries um, across multiple different areas as well as Broadacre, um, all following quite a similar process that I actually think is quite um, similar to a lot of the literature in startups um, that around how to work with early customers and have a, a, um, a customer focus right from the start to drive product development. Fantastic, thank you. And of course, AgTech isn't just entirely about being on the farm. And Matt, I'd, I'd like you to share some of your experience about how important are agricultural supply chains in building a strong AgTech ecosystem? And can you leverage these to create companies and scale globally? Yeah, thanks, Kate. I, actually, I think this, this actually ties the first two questions together in some way, which is that um, we can't just rely on farmers to adopt everything, right? They, they can't have the entire responsibility to be the change makers here. And the supply chains do hold a lot of the um, answer to, to delivering significant system change across, across agri-food. So when in, in a blatant piece of self-promotion, we, we wrote an article specifically about this called How Silicon Valley Set Ag Tech Back a Decade. And so for all the budding entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about playing in this area, it, it's not enough to just go to a farm and say, how do you do what you do? You have to have done enough work to understand where does what happen on farm relate to what happens post-farm? Because a lot of the value actually accretes further down the, the supply chain. And so to sort of expect all of the economic replumbing to be done at the farm is unrealistic. Um, it's unrealistic, you know, just from an economic sense, but it's also unrealistic from a kind of attention sense. So when you hear stories about farmers are kind of sick of people coming and showing them all these different products, it's part of that phenomenon. So when we look to the supply chain, so for example, there was a question there about, about energy efficiency. Fantastic. I mean, there are a lot of kinds of agricultural production uh, that are, you know, energy intensive. If you're trying to get them to lower energy bills or move to renewables or something, who are their downstream processes? Who are the retail products that want to go to market with a low carbon or zero carbon product? Solve the problem there further downstream in the supply chain and then work out how the economic incentives can be aligned to deal with the education or the adoption or the changeover and things that ultimately will need to happen on farm. So you're absolutely right, Kate, that supply chains and the downstream participants from farming are instrumental. I would say either side, actually, from you know, kind of buyer and input supplier point of view, as well as people downstream. We really have to take a systems view of how we want technology to help 
in the transformation uh, of agriculture to make it, you know, continue to make sure that it's profitable, continue to make sure that it's sustainable um, and absolutely understanding the kind of total value chain, um, who in the supply chain has the ability to absorb uh, change better or perhaps is a little more concentrated and therefore their interventions can potentially also be more meaningful. Um, so I think, you know, understanding all that before you lob on farm and say, hey, we have thought this through and we've got agreement from someone you supply to who, who said they really would like to help you adopt this practice change is going to, that conversation is just going to go a whole lot better. Thank you and, and great insights there. And Chris, I'd like to bring you in now, um, you know, sitting in a large corporate, how is the traditional innovation model as it applies to supply chains that, you know, Bayer has obviously got a huge amount of oversight and influence in. How, how is that, um, how is Bayer's philosophy um, changed over time as the ag tech sector has started to, uh, to grow in Australia? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And it's, it's causing within Bayer, um, a really large rethink of innovation as a concept. And, you know, we have a, specifically for our company, we have a, a over 150 year history of, of various forms of innovation. And if I look at, as you mentioned, a more traditional um, view of innovation in our, in our core um, uh, agricultural chemical input uh, business, um, it's a very linear approach. I could say, uh, I could tell you from the point of discovery of a molecule, we're probably looking at 10 to 12 years in a fairly linear fashion, um, a relatively fixed cost of that innovation, which might be 350 million euros over that, that, that journey to have a molecule that's discovered and then ultimately on a shelf and available for, for sale. As we look at ag tech and our journey in it now and thinking of how we can develop and more importantly, co-develop digital tools um, for, for, for use in agriculture. It's a far more iterative process. It's a lot more open. Um, it's a lot more partnership driven. I would say even within relatively narrow bands of solution delivery to, to a farming operation, um, it's almost impossible to be a sole provider of a solution. So it, it, it drives us um, to be much more open in how we engage with, um, with other participants and other solution providers to um, bring a, a digital solution to a grower. So just as like as an example, um, we might be thinking of technology that can um, you know, drive a more targeted application of, of our own inputs. Um, we can't do that without um, potentially image recognition technology, machine learning capability, and ultimately precision agriculture uh, equipment to uh, ultimately deliver um, the, the outcome that we're looking for, which might be a reduction in herbicides that we, we apply on a field. Um, there's no way Bayer can provide or deliver all of the aspects of the of that technology stack. Um, so at the earlier stages now, we're considering who do we need to work with, what what other solutions or technologies or skills can we harness that aren't within Bayer, and that's a a huge shift in philosophy for a company like ours, which has tended to, in, in really every sense, own its innovation story. Um, so it's it's certainly a huge shift, but one that it's um, it's extremely exciting because it it, it brings us. Um, into contact with so many um, innovative uh, and, and market leading businesses. And uh, it's, uh, it's certainly a much faster paced um, delivery of those solutions and technologies. And this obviously highlights the opportunity that's out there. And I know that we've got a lot of people on the line who are probably joining because they're interested in LaunchFix's latest grant round and what that means. And I know we've got a, a question from Jeff about whether we're trying to um, duplicate Sparatex. And the answer is no, not at all. What we want to do is support organisations um, that are doing things like Sparatex is doing, like Rocket Seed is doing and others to provide more support to more entrepreneurs. So we definitely want to, to see programs come to life that are multiple programs that are going to come to life across the state that are going to support those entrepreneurs with with great ideas so that then leads on to a question from our friend julia at sprout x who's asked um what are the biggest challenges in agriculture what are the lesser support lesser explored frontiers for ag tech for all those budding entrepreneurs on the line that are thinking about where they could focus a business where would you recommend they start looking phoebe i'm going to throw to you on this one I think it's such a it's such a fantastic question and for me I think Kate you touched on it earlier and, and Matthew as well that agriculture was um, and the challenges that it presents to feed 10 billion people by 2050 and the kinds of food production system challenges that we have 
um, are so engaging. And I know that for me and for my co-founder, Alex, that for us, we felt that what we'd learned in our early careers, although different to what we're doing now, um, were a really great training ground to step into and take a risk on a new type of technology that we felt could ultimately, ultimately had the potential to have an incredible impact on the whole global food system if successful. And we hope that other people that were thinking about these kinds of global challenges in the way that we were also took those types of risks. Um, I mean, I don't think it's immediately obvious to build a insect farming autonomous system. I mean, I told some stories earlier about the really early days of how we got Barty off the ground, but now what that looks like is a in um, a year of being at our new commercial pilot facility is a facility that can process 10 tons of input in every eight hours and produce real products that are consistent and, and going out into the market and, and onto farms. And so some of the other areas that I think are really interesting are areas in agriculture that are connections between that urban and rural connection, areas in the alternative protein space as well. Um, what kinds of food products can we be producing and what are consumers interested in the future? How can we link sustainable development goals from the UN to what happens um, before food ends up available for us to purchase? And I think both Protein as well as fertilizer can pay a really, play a really big story in that, but there's also so many other parts of that journey that can be tackled. Um, and I think really any insight that you have is worth pursuing if you're able to um, first validate by talking to the people that are experiencing the problem or really assessing the opportunity and thinking about what kind of future you want to build. Fantastic. I'm going to throw to Matt as well, because you sitting at Tenacious Ventures would see a whole array of, of um, startups coming through your door. Where are you seeing the trends? But I'm also going to ask you to answer the question from John Hartnett from SVG Thrive, um, who I know you know, who's asked, what are the biggest challenges for ag tech uh, entrepreneurs in Australia? Yeah, thanks, Kate. Hey, John. Um, I think we have to decide how what playing to our strengths looks like and and so um <clears throat> where where research where agricultural research originally came from australia or still largely comes from is with a view to making australian farmers more efficient and more productive and more profitable and and those are really important policy settings um but at our best maybe i don't know we can feed 150 million people and, and that's not enough um Another way you can look at that is that we, we have two decades of climate adaptive agricultural research under our belt. And, and this is particularly true. I mean, you know, AgVic would, would be a good example of this kind of treasure trove of stuff that we haven't got out there to a wide enough audience. And so I think the challenge for us um, and for entrepreneurs is to think about, are we gonna frame our opportunities around just, you know, farming in Australia or are we going to frame the opportunities around, you know, this massive global uh, opportunity to take stuff that we significantly have already done and maximise the impact of that uh, on, on a global basis? And, you know, to John's point, that is tough for Australia. A ag tech um, as an ecosystem, we don't quite have enough... Um, uh, you know, sort of gravitational force. And so what we do see at the moment is Australian companies will tend to move out of Australia and possibly a little earlier than we would like them to. I, I reckon that's okay, because if you look at other parts of tech, you know, enterprise SaaS would be a good example. We have reached gravitational pull and we can hold on to and grow, you know, companies with real scale. We're starting to see that in ag tech. So I think that's, you know, I think the areas to really dig into are the ones that are leveraging our strengths, you know, and, and that very much has to do with lower intensity input production, whether it's energy, whether it's, you know, you know, every kind of input, certainly chemical intensity, energy intensity, input intensity, using those efficiently, um, climate adaptive agriculture, which is something that everybody is going to have to get used to, um, and, and really um, committing to making that uh, something that we're pursuing in parallel with making sure that Australian farmers continue to hold their place at the top of the league table in terms of, you know, 
really high quality and, and significantly uh, economic uh, contribution from, from exporting both produce as well as, as, as knowledge economy products. Yeah, great answer. And it, you, you raise a very important point, and it's part of the reason why Ag Agriculture Victoria and Launch Vicar partnering is that we, we have seen that gravitational pull around other industries in the tech sector, health tech, SaaS, yep. um, B2B, fintech. We are holding our own on a global scale and you can grow global companies from Victoria and you have access to great talent and you've got access to investors that are prepared to in, invest in you, not at just at early stage, but all the way through your life cycle journey. We haven't yet established that in ag tech and that's that is really important and of course one part of that is making sure you've got local people that are prepared to buy from you if you yeah. haven't got local customers it makes it really hard to to try to be sticky and remain in, in victoria so i'm going to throw to a great question by mark ryan and throw this to you chris uh, when does ag tech become a dominant priority for farmers and what are the triggers for example is it when they're considering exporting or trialing new crops or trying to use less pesticide I think it's um, honestly, I think it's all of the above. I think if we look at, um, I guess the the expectations that society has now of agriculture have changed. I think dramatically over the last couple of decades in terms of where agriculture sits in the broader um, ecosystem of, of of our society, and we're looking at you know, sustainability outcomes, for example. And I'd say, you know, Matt mentioned um, at, at the very top of the session how inherently um, innovative our grower base is um, and they are alongside uh, New Zealand growers you know the most or well, the least subsidized um, growing um, cohorts in in the OECD so they have over the course of decades had a need to you know, essentially own their own innovation sto story and they are inherently curious and looking to improve what they do so I think in terms of their mindset around taking on ag tech and, and general innovation I think that's always there across all aspects of their farming operation and all and, and the majority of outcomes that they seek to deliver and whether they are um, questions of sustainability uh, and maintaining a license to operate and 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 to you know, maintain a, a sustainable footprint on their land and, and Matt again you know absolutely nailed it before when describing the, the very close attachment the growers have you know to their land um, so certainly in a sustainability situation um, there's a huge drive and curiosity from growers to embrace technology to improve their outcomes in that space. I think their ability to access um, markets both now and in the future um, certainly will, uh, will, will create for them a need to embrace um, different growing practices. Um, if we see uh, not too far down the track um, scenarios where access to markets may in some way be impacted by um, their ability to prove um, carbon performance on their farm and, and other elements of sustainable outcomes on their farms. Um, you know, there will be pressure on them that they'll embrace to, um, to, to, to take on new technologies and embrace new practices. So I think, I, I think it will, it's, it's all encompassing for farmers. But again, I, I stress um, their in innovative mindset, um, yeah, will create um, great opportunities for the right products and solutions to, to find traction. So again, great, great answer. And, and Phoebe, I'm going to riff off that and jump to a comment from a question from Amir, who asks, what's the best way to manage expectations when you are trialing out a new technology on farm? Mm, I think that's a really, really fantastic um, question. And I've always had the, we've always had a focus on bodies, making sure that we're giving as much as possible um, to those early partners who are trialing products with us. The other thing that's been really critical for us is to sequence the journey along the way to build strength in the product so that we know when we are going to on-farm trials that we're able to deliver something that, that we have a high confidence interval being in it being successful. So I've spoken a little bit about how the insect protein that we're producing is currently going into pet food but for over a year now we've already been working on how we can transition the insect protein we produce into being included in animal feeds in in poultry and aqua feeds and so we speak to those um, those farms and the feed formulators for how they're creating those kinds of farms and how we can partner with them to create a nutritional and sustainable feed 
alternative. It's been incredibly critical, um, those areas around feed. There are very high expectations around food conversion ratios and an enormous amount of research that's gone into that space. So how we manage expectations is actually um, finding other areas where we can achieve our, um, and other markets where we can we can test and learn about our product more easily before we move into those incredibly high technical execution areas. But along that way, continue to update those ahead of trials. How are we going on, you know, particular important technical metrics? Like what are, what's our calcium content in the larvae protein? What's the exact what kind of temperatures are they able to withstand in a rendering process? All of these technical details we work through before a trial so that by the time we get there, the the farmer, in this case, I'm talking about a, a poultry farm or an aqu uh, um, in aquaculture before we're actually feeding to fish, it's, we've actually gone on a journey with that team prior. And so there's a really strong understanding of the product. And then we're really learning together during the trial. So the way we set expectations is building that strong relationship first, making sure we're listening to the delivery that's required, moving our product towards being able to be included, um, and then agreeing on an acceptable point when, when we all believe in a high confidence interval that's likely to have a successful result. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's really going on the journey together and that and that takes work and relationship building to deliver and and part of that is building trust um, I'm always the first person to go to um, the customers that we work with and say hey we got our weekly independent lab test result and it looks different to what we we're expecting how's that going to impact you do we need to adjust our timelines so Leading with that, I think, has been really successful in terms of setting expectations that, that we need to go on a journey together to make this possible or to have new, part, new, um, new products entering the market. Yeah, fantastic. And so another question from Elena Young at Startup Shakeup, a shout out to our friends in Northeast Vic. Um, to what extent is digital confidence and digital literacy a hurdle to moving, the ag moving into greater adoption of ag tech? And how do we build that confidence if you think that there's an issue? Matt, I'm going to throw to you for that one. Yeah, that, that's, it's an interesting one to ponder because the, the kind of easy answer is that it's a problem and, and it's a reason, it's, it's a barrier to adoption. But really good technology makes itself invisible. And so I think the what you, you know, kind of go back to the answer, which is make sure that you're solving the problem that's actually there rather than the, you know, solving it the way that became apparent when, when you found a tool or a technology or something like that. And um, yeah, so if, if literacy is a problem, then, you know, that's that's part of the solution really that you're going to have to work through simply saying people need to you know, learn how to do stuff better doesn't get you to scale like if we all had to vaccinate ourselves you know we'd be in a worse situation than we're in now um there, there's a role for expertise there's a role for you know designing systems that don't ask more of people than they can be reasonably expected to have and that's not to say that you know farmers aren't capable it's just that you know they already have an awful lot of things that they need to be experts in um and actually just to segue back to, to phoebe's point farmers are really good at managing risk and so if your product or innovation is in a phase where it's risky just really openly communicate and offer mitigation strategies so if your inclusion can't get there have already teed up an alternate supplier something like that and, and then i think you would find those kind of conversations go better and better and it's probably similar to this to this literacy problem for sure it's a challenge i would say one area where it's definitely a challenge is once we're asking farmers to take a lot more of these newer products on their farm and they become reliant on them then things certainly like after sales service and repair and maintenance and all those will will be issues. And I think that, you know, massive opportunities for our TAFE sector to really step up there and, you know, equip people with the right kind of skills that they need. And that'll that'll those will be digital, those will be electromechanical. Um, you know, uh, so I think there's there's lots for us to do, but we shouldn't take the perspective that that's 
that's immediately a, a barrier to adoption. Let, let's be more creative. Let's find ways to make the technology disappear as much as we possibly can. Chris, you've come off mute. Yeah, just, just to add to Matt's comment, um, I think you know, at, at the moment we're, we're preparing you know, this market for a, for, for a digital product of our own. And in our you know, early beta testing work that we've been conducting with growers, I think, um, and there's learnings, um, I think, for startups just as much as it has been for us in, in this, there are particular points of a customer's journey with your solution that you will identify as being critical points where their ability to succeed with your solution um, will be the difference maker between their continued engagement with it or their turning away from it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think, and literacy within your solution is certainly one aspect of that. Matt just touched on another there in terms of how are you supporting them after the after the sale and with ongoing use. And I would just encourage people with a with a solution in mind to really take some time to think about the journey that you expect the farmer to take with your product and be very mindful of where those critical points are and ensuring that to the extent that you need to be, you're present, you're supporting them and you're giving them the environment that they need to then be able to successfully engage with it and have a successful journey with your product. So literacy is a component, but there will be others that you'll need to consider in that, uh, in that journey. Fantastic. And Chris, I'm going to um, just expand that out a bit. Another um, key issue is, is data and privacy. And careful consideration needs to be given to these two in addition to the risk that farmers have to manage. And obviously that does become a, a potentially a, a real risk point. Who owns the data is something that many people grapple with across many different sectors. Um, what would you say to anyone in the ag tech sector who has concerns about security and management of their, of their data? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kate. I'd say that's um, you know, when we talk to growers about um, about our product or and generally um, tools and, and solutions in this space, the question that's asked more often than not is exactly that. It's a question of what happens to my data. And in many cases, when we're looking at solutions that are collecting data from a farm for use to benefit that farm, um, there's a high level, understandably, um, of sensitivity around that topic. Um, our philosophy around this is, is very clear and very simple, and that is at all times, any data that's collected on a farm that is, um, for example, lands in, in a cloud that we maintain, um, remains at all times the property of the farmer and will always do so. So um, that remains theirs. Um, we don't share that data with any party outside of those specifically um, mentioned, for example, in an agreement we might have with the farmer. Um, and that includes um, other parts of our own business. Um, so we are, we are extremely careful that a farmer who signs up for our product is doing so for a specific purpose. And that is for data to be um, within our server for their own visualization and use. Um, we maintain uh, the opportunity to use that data for scientific purposes to provide new models back to that grower. Um, but that's as far as the data use goes um, and, and the processing goes. Um, so it's a it's a really really clear point. And again, if um, you know if, if a solution, if you if uh, startups are considering solutions that involve the generation of data from a farm, um, it's a really a, a clear topic that should be at the top of your mind to to be able to um, uh, explain uh, to growers your your philosophy and how that data will be used. Phoebe, I saw you nodding at this as well when I asked the question. Do you have anything you want to add on data? I just I think it's an incredibly important area to deliver clarity on for all customers in terms of how you collect trial data. Even for us, we're not providing a digital solution to farmers, but we do um, use a lot of sensors and different collect different kinds of data when we run trials in order to help us better use the product. So we're really careful that when we're trialing application rates in particular areas where we understand the soil, the crop, that all of that specific information and we're providing information back to the to the farm and to the grower about their own um, how they could potentially work with our product to improve their yield or growth or you know different kinds of metrics we look at that that's very clear what part of that is just going to be held by them and for their own use. Um, similarly, in many ways, Bardi is a farm. And so we build lots of internal software tools. And so we understand the power of those kinds of um, data analytics 
that can be run. Um, and so I think for us, we come with a perspective of, yeah, having a fund that uses lots of data to make decisions. And then we really try to honor that in how we provide data and give value to trial customers and to growers. Fantastic. I'm going to change the conversation again. Um, obviously, we've spoken about farmers and we've spoken about the on farm, we've spoken about supply chains and founders. We haven't yet spoken about investment. And there are naturally a couple of questions that are coming through on the line. Um, the first one is, um, you know, what do you look for in a company before you're investing? And um, is there a space for pre-revenue um, investments? Matt, this goes to you. I'm also going to tack on another one about what what is the level of interest in from LPs, limited partners, investors in investing specifically in, in, in ag tech as a vertical? Yeah, thanks. Um, super important questions, I think, especially when we compare ag tech to other <clears throat> early stage ecosystems. Our tenacious answer is revenue is a horrible trailing indicator um, because fundamentally there's, there's so much uh, th that needs to be done to make, to, to, because of the supply chain, because of the importance of the supply chain, business model is far more important and it's also likely to move a lot slower than, you know, DAUs and user signups and the kind of metrics that we're used to seeing in tech. And so what we look for is solid evidence. So like a founder believes something that most people don't, right? And a founder is trying to bring people into that world that they believe in and, and we're one of the groups they're trying to bring in. But the other people are trying to bring in is visionary customers. And if that visionary customer has bought into a founder's view, they will already be adjusting the way their business operates in anticipation of the thing being true. Now, it might still be years away from being true, but if it's so impactful, and they, and they buy your vision, then we will see evidence of that. And, and yeah, like pilot revenue and that kind of stuff, it's pretty low grade evidence. But when, when we see potential customers changing the way they're organizing their internal resources, and you know, those are really strong signals. That's the kind of stuff we wanna see. So that's a long answer to the question, which is we don't have to see specific revenue. We certainly don't have ARR targets or anything like that. We wanna see absolutely potential for impact. And we haven't really today talked heaps about impact as a, as a natural um, outcome of, of agriculture innovation as well, but also potential for global application. You know, Australia is, a modest size as far as agricultural economies are concerned. There are a lot of agricultural economies that operate in similar ways. And so some companies will have a fairly straightforward path outside of Australia. Some companies will need to adapt a lot and take into a lot of thinking, you know, smallholder farming and how other systems work. But those really are the things that, that we're looking for. So not just innovation, but a business model insight, evidence that that insight really delivers economics that, that will be impactful to a customer and global application. Fantastic. And Chris, I'm going to throw one to you. Is Bayer, as a, as a, a large organization active in this space, are you interested in M&A activity with um, smaller companies or co even co-developing innovative digital ag tech solutions? What sort of stage do you like to see companies at before you start to interact with them? Um, yeah, great question. Um, the short answer to, to the first part of the question, at least, we're, we're extremely active and interested um, in in, uh, in, uh, in in investments directly in, into ag tech and to and to uh, external businesses. So um, very clear, we've got a, a specific team devoted exactly to that, with a focus on um, ag tech as as a vertical um, within the broader house of, of Bayer as a healthcare and and um, and agriculturally active business. So um, so to answer your first part, exactly there. Uh, in terms of where on the journey. Um, a fairly wide spectrum, as, as Matt said, it doesn't have to be, it, it can be pre-revenue. In fact, um, some discussions that are currently underway between us and, and local players are pre-revenue based discussions. So um, it, we don't have to also see revenue. And I think Beko, um, I think the, the key dynamics of Matt's, Matt's answer there, I think in terms of what we're looking for, I guess as a business that has a specific role as an input provider and we're expanding into digital tools, I think sir, there are some typical triggers that we like to see or aspects that we like to see of a business when we consider potential investment. Uh, and that's typically to do with, do we see the solution or the mission of a particular company being additive to 
the path that we may have defined for ourselves in providing solutions in a certain aspect of a farming environment. Um, that, that to us can be quite critical. So for, for example, a, a topic that's um, yeah, quite active in Bayer as it is throughout agriculture generally at the moment is carbon farming. Um, so if we're looking at you know, potential um, partnership opportunities there, we'd be looking um, within that space to identify is the particular mission or solution of a business um, in, in that specific segment are we, are we viewing that as being additive to a solution or a role that we see ourselves as playing? Um, so that may, in a sense, guide us. Um, but within the, I guess, the, the spectrum of where a, a startup is on its journey towards commercialisation and, and revenue, um, quite a wide, a wide band. Fantastic. Thank you. So I know we're fast running out of time. I'm going to ask one more question and ask you all to keep your answers very brief, if I can. Just going from a closing out, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions of ag tech and what does the future look like? Phoebe, in one minute, I'm going to throw to, well, I'm going to, throw to you for a one minute answer and I'll do the same with Chris and Matt to close out. I think often the volumes in agriculture can be so large um, initially that it can seem quite difficult to start or to move in and start to supply in those spaces. And I think sometimes founders that I speak to or mentor think that they need to go out and get a really large volume of capital and ev ev to, before they even start proving out um, those early stage technologies. And I think that's a misconception. I think that it is possible to take small scrappy steps, even in ag tech, while working really closely with future customers in order to sequence out a journey where you work out what small thing can I create a, a proof point on that will lead me into being able to demonstrate more in the future. And if you're able to do that, it's um, you can do that in quite a lean way and move quite quickly without being held back by thinking, oh, I need lots of capital to even get started. Um, and I think taking that approach it could potentially see more innovative solutions come to fruition. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Well, I think there's a perception that, that agri-tech is not particularly big and not particularly impactful, and, and it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, Oz, Oz Agri-tech exists because we see this massive global opportunity and we want, we want a national uh, ecosystem that is, that is of equivalent you know, scale and importance. And as far as impact and climate solutions are concerned, like you couldn't find a more practical place to deliver change than in helping transform uh, the, the, you know, agricultural system globally. And actually, you know, to, to the question about LP interest, that is the majority of the LP interest in, in investing in agriculture because of its ability to deliver climate solutions to the planet. Fantastic answer. And Chris? Yeah, I, I won't repeat the, the early two comments, which I fully agree with. Um, you know, it's possible to be agile and to be pretty lean to get started. We, I'm, I'm seeing that myself. I'd say in terms of the future, uh, it, it's extremely bright for solutions here. I think if we look at the mega trends that are impacting in agriculture, they've been mentioned today, a growing population, changing dietary um, trends um, and the strain on the ecosystems. It is a very, um, if I can say, fertile ground for innovation and solutions. And we have a core market or stakeholder group in farmers that are ready for change um, and in themselves inherently innovative. So um, it's it's a great spot to be at the moment. Um, so yeah, nothing more to add. Fantastic. And thank you so much. Um, to, to Phoebe, Matt and Chris, your insights have been absolutely invaluable. I started off behind the scenes before we jumped into the public webinar saying I'm not much of an tech expert. I feel like I'm a little bit further along that journey and understand the importance. I certainly understand the importance of startups to our economy. And it's something that we're very passionate about at Launch Vic. We also know that agriculture is a very important export sector for Victoria. And it's why we have launched our grant round for anyone who's interested in finding out what they can do to help our entrepreneurs in ag tech proliferate please do attend our information session 11 o'clock on the 22nd of September if you are an aspiring entrepreneur with a bright idea I strongly encourage you to reach out to the Launch Vic website and the other groups like Rocket Cedar and Spreatex who are doing a phenomenal job in the sector of supporting ag tech entrepreneurs my um Final thanks um, goes to Agriculture Victoria and the team um, in the Victorian government who've supported us in the partnership. We're absolutely thrilled to be working in this sector. And very finally, thank you to the Launch Vic team for the phenomenal job of pulling everything together today. And thank you to all our attendees for attending what was a really insightful discussion. Thank you very much.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.